Kazim from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a program of adventure with Howard Duff as your host. Here's a preview. Frank, just exactly what is the difference between a human and a clone? Well, to the naked eye, there is absolutely no difference. But to the trained observer, they are light years apart from us. They're solid state while we're diodes and triodes, huh? Exactly. A Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Howard Duff. The time is the future, and men are still endowed with certain inalienable rights. Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Add to this list the right to a clone, a living, breathing, exact copy of yourself. A close watch is kept on the development of the clone's human counterpart. Should the human exhibit certain superior qualities, his clone is then taken aside and given corresponding special attention. Captain Jason Tucker is a celebrated space pilot and hero. He is one prodigy whose clone received a parallel upbringing. We join Captain Tucker in the office of General Clifford Gordon, head of the space agency. You are aware, Jason, that for the past three years, we've been integrating clones into various programs here at the space agency. I understand the transition hasn't been a smooth one, sir. Well, we've had our share of problems with the clones, but we're ready to employ them on missions with our human astronauts. Why bother, General? Among other things, Jason, every clone in the space program has undergone a genetic adjustment which slows its metabolism and effectively triples its lifespan. Yeah, I get the picture. On a mission requiring a lifetime by our standards, you simply use a clone. Exactly. We have also sent clones on reconnaissance missions into unexplored reaches of the galaxy when we deemed the risk factor too great. You do know that your clone is in the manned flight program, don't you? Of course, General. Although I've never met him. But just exactly what does all this have to do with me? Well, Jason, how would you like to go on a mission with yourself? And uh, that's only the beginning of our story. Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Two Faces of Evil, by Mark Trella. Our stars, Barney Phillips and Howard Culver. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. Captain Jason Tucker, a man whose name is synonymous with dramatic exploits in space, now discusses an intriguing proposal with his superior, General Clifford Gordon. A proposal which would send Captain Tucker on a mission with an exact replica of himself, his clone. <laughs> How would I like to go on a mission with myself? Well, I'm the only person I don't get along with, General. Jason, what do you know about Janus II? Well, it's a deep space monitor about three months' journey away. Janus 2 is not quite a year old. At the time it was launched, it contained the most advanced data-gathering equipment available. At the controls was an Artronic robot computer. An Artronic robot computer? How much is one of those worth? Mm, conservative estimate, $11 million. The whole setup worked fine for about six months. Then Artronic went haywire and has been transmitting sophisticated gibberish ever since. You suggesting that I try to repair the robot computer on Janus 2? I'm suggesting nothing of the sort, Jason. Our scientists need to examine our tronic down here. All I want you to do is bring the robot computer back to Earth for repairs. If you agree, your clone will accompany you to Janus 2. Just the two of us? That's not much of a crew, General. You're forgetting that there won't be much room left in the probe after you've placed our tronic on board. Sounds like cramped quarters on the return trip, huh? Well, not really. Your clone won't be making the return trip. You won't? Well, you've got to have pretty good reason to abandon someone in deep space, General. Oh, come now, Jason. Your clone won't be abandoned on Janus II. He'll be stationed there. To look after the data gathering equipment, huh? Correct. And to serve as representative of the human race. Representative? Remember now, we positioned Janus II in a hot spot, a vortex which our scientists believe 
is a very busy corner of the galaxy. Initial contact with extraterrestrial life forms is imminent in this location. Well, why choose my clone to be an envoy? What better example of the human species than an exact copy of the world's most celebrated space hero? Oh, I suppose it adds a more personal touch than greetings from a robot computer. Of course. And your clone can survive quite comfortably on Janus 2 for at least 80 years. And how does my clone feel about all this? Why don't we ask him, Jason? So that, I just got word from General Gordon. He's bringing Captain Jason Tucker over to meet you. Captain Tucker, the space hero? Uh, one and only. And Jovan, try to say as little as possible. I'll do all the talking. R -r -r right, sir. Do you think it has something to do with the Janus 2 mission, Colonel Kane? I know it does. I haven't been working you double time these past four months for nothing. Do you think there's a chance they'll pick me for the mission? There's a very good chance, if you do exactly as I say. Just follow my orders and everything will be fine. The captain and I are old friends. We were crew members on the area's mission to Mars. I didn't know that, sir. All right, now, get yourself inside the simulator and rehearse some of the mid-flight course correction maneuvers. I want Captain Tucker to see exactly what your capabilities are. Colonel King, can you come over here for a minute? Yes, sir, General Gordon. Be right with you. General Gordon? Well, Jason... It's good to see you again. Been ages, Frank. How are you? I've uh, been rather busy. Jason Frank heads the Duo Genetics program. Oh? When did this come about? I took over the program a while back. Frank is in charge of selecting and training clones for the space program. Oh, interesting. As you've undoubtedly heard, we've had some problems in the program, but I think we've finally reached the point where we'll be able to realize some dividends. And that's where my clone comes in, huh? Jason, your clone is under Frank's personal instruction. That's right. Jovan is extremely gifted. Uh, that's him operating the simulator. Frank, just exactly what is the difference between a human and a clone? Well, to the naked eye, there is absolutely no difference. But to the trained observer, they are light years apart from us. They're solid states while we're diodes and triodes, huh? Exactly. They're not hampered by the excess baggage we humans carry about. What excess baggage is that, Frank? Our emotions, of course. You can imagine how much more efficient this makes the clones, Jason. Clones, after all, are the next logical step in man's perfection of himself. Well, how do they react in situations requiring split-second decision-making? We tend to feel that... Uh... Can they think for themselves, Frank? Of course they can. We're not making robots here. Frank, why don't you tell Jason about the training program you've outlined for Jovan? Why don't we have Jovan tell the captain himself? <laughs> Every precaution is taken to see that a person never meets his clone. Psychologically, such a meeting could prove to be disturbing. However, there have been exceptions, and uh, Captain Jason Tucker is one of them. The moment has arrived for him to meet his clone. How will he react to this confrontation with his double? Jovan, I'd like you to meet Captain Jason Tucker. He will decide whether you will accompany him on the Janus 2 mission. Hello, Captain. Oh, Jovan. Excuse me, I, I can't help but feel a bit eerie meeting you face-to-face -face like this. Jovan, why don't you describe some of the training you've undergone? Well, certainly. Colonel Kane sees that I spend at least six hours a day in the simulator practicing every conceivable maneuver, including docking. I have committed to memory every one of the Medea space probe's internal and external systems, their maintenance and repair. Do you think I you also... could endure a three-month voyage aboard Medea? That's 90 days in a space no bigger than an average-sized living room. After the rigorous training I've undergone, three months in Medea would seem like a vacation. I can assure you this won't be a pleasure cruise. Well, I, I only m m m meant that... I know what you meant, and there'll be no joyriders on my ship. Sir, I, I will do my, my, my best. Why are you stammering? Uh, ease off, Jason. Uh, sometimes Jovan stutters a bit. Uh, it's no big deal. I'll bet he's just thrilled to meet his idol. Uh, y yes, sir. I, I've followed your c career, and I admire you, you... Well, thank you, Jovan. Sorry I snapped at you. Jason, I think we should return to my office. Jason, there was 
absolutely no reason for you to be harsh with Jovan. I wanted to see how he'd react, General. What did you discover? That he has a weakness. That was hardly called stammering a weakness. All right, call it an imperfection. I thought clones were the next logical step in man's perfection of himself. Look, Frank gets carried away with his own rhetoric. I'd rather you didn't hold him to that remark. And why is Frank Kane heading the duo genetics program, General? Because he's a thorough instructor and a good disciplinarian. General, that man panicked on the Ares mission and almost lost an entire crew. I know how you feel about Frank, but... But why is he selecting and training the clones? Why don't you forget the past, Jason? Frank has changed. He's dedicated to the success of this program. For the past 18 months, he and Jovan have practically lived in that simulator. 18 months? Sounds like my clone was being prepared to accompany me long before I was aware of such a proposal. This was a contingency plan, Jason. We felt you would be honored to have your clone representing the world on Janus 2. Don't let Captain Tucker throw you, Jovan. I won't, sir, but he snapped at me for no reason. He was just testing you. He plays the same game with all his crew members. As I recall, you went on the Ares mission to Mars with Captain Tucker. I sure did. It was after the Ares mission that Captain Tucker became a big space hero. Now, let me tell you something, Jovan. He didn't do a thing up there. I was the one who rescued that crew. You did? But how come you didn't get the credit? Captain Tucker was the commander on that mission. How would it look if the commander panicked and stranded an exploration party on the surface of Mars? <laughs> Let's just say that the captain took the credit for my heroics. I never realized that. Well, I'm just filling you in about the captain's psychological makeup. If he chooses you for the mission, you'll need to know all about him. What else should I know, Colonel? That Captain Tucker is a very insecure man. He could turn on you at a moment's notice, just like he did today. He looks perfectly normal. Sure he does. But he's managed to conceal his true personality from just about everyone. He's a potentially dangerous man. I'm really grateful that you're telling me all this, sir. Well, I'd rather you heard it from me, Jovan. And remember, this is our little secret. I don't mean to sound impertinent, General, but why are you so anxious for Jovan to accompany me on this mission? I don't deny that Washington would like another first in space. They feel that placing your clone on Janus II would be a noble gesture. And I'm inclined to agree. Jason, clones are the future of the space program, and you might as well get used to that fact. Well, between the two of us, sir, what's your honest opinion of Jovan? If you want my honest opinion, Jovan has worked hard for this mission, harder than any human astronaut. I think he deserves a shot. I only take him as far as the space station. And you leave him there. All right, then. Jovan goes with me to Janus, too. Jovan, take a break. General Gordon just called. You're going to Janus 2 with Captain Tucker. Right, sir. But what are my orders? Your orders are to deliver Captain Tucker to Janus 2. Once there, you'll pick up the Artronic robot computer and return to Earth alone. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Sounds simple enough. And if something should go wrong, I'll be standing by to lead a rescue mission. That's a relief to know, sir. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something if I had to rescue Captain Jason Tucker? Then I might get some recognition after all. Frank, since you've worked so close with the clone, I'd rather you be the one to explain to him his role in the Janus II mission. I understand, sir. Ideally, we would like Jovan's wholehearted consent to be stationed on Janus II for the next 80 years. That would be ideal, sir. However, if he is less than enthusiastic, you will order him to stay there. Don't worry about that, sir. Clones are entirely obedient, and Jovan is no exception. Good. We don't want anything to go wrong, Frank. Of course not, General. Fine. Well, there are some minor points I'd like to clear up with Captain Tucker. Good luck, Colonel. Save it for Captain Tucker. You'll need plenty of luck once his clone abandons him on Janus 2. Hurtling through space in a self-contained environment no bigger than an average-sized living room are Captain Jason Tucker and his clone, Jovan. They're well into the second month of their three-month mission. And as yet, neither one of them is aware that they are each following a different set of orders. 
You know, we've been on this mission for well over two months, Jovan, and every time you open your mouth, I never hear more than a handful of words. Are you conserving energy? No, sir. In a close quarter situation like this one, it's only natural for me to be curious, and the less you say, the more curious I become. Curious about what, sir? About you, of course. This person that looks exactly like me. You know, I'd like to know something about you. You know, anything. Is that against the rules? No, sir. Where would you like me to begin? Where would you like to begin? I was cloned 35 years ago, brought up in the Federal Regeneration Institute near Atlanta, progressed through grade 18, and was withdrawn from the system for re-reprogramming. Reprogramming? Why? To, to bring, 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 bring my emotions under control. And the stammering? Uh, a result of my re-reprogramming. Re well, I'm sorry, Joe Well, I'm not, sir. Now I'm much more efficient. Without feelings, huh? Exactly. Don't you ever wish you had feelings, Jovan? No, sir. What would I do with them? Mission Control to Media. Come in, Media. This is Medea, Mission Control. General Gordon is here and would like to speak with you. Put the general on. Hello, Jason. Sorry I haven't contacted you in a while. How's everything going up there? Peaches and cream, General. Jason, reconnaissance reports a high concentration of space debris in the upcoming sector. I want you to be on your guard. We will, sir. Thanks for the warning. Keep up the good work, you two. We're very proud of you both. Thanks for the pep talk, General. Roger and out. Well, Jovan, at one point I had my doubts about choosing you for this mission. Was it because I look exactly like you? Well, that's part of it. And the other part concerns my lack of emotion. Yeah, you guessed it. General Gordon had to do some fancy talking to convince me to take you along. I never did like the idea of using clones in the space program. So we're back to square one. I disturb you because I don't display my feelings. Well, I'm an emotional guy, and at times it's got me into trouble. Other times it saved my life and the lives of others. I didn't ask to be a hero, but in certain situations you go on your instincts, your feelings. Is that what happened on the Ares mission? Yeah, something like that. What a catastrophe that was. What really happened up there, Captain? Colonel Kane said that he was the... Oh. What was that? I, I, I d d don't know, sir. Or whatever it was, it had to knock us off course. I, I fired a maneuvering rocket to, to right, right the ship. Took out of this port. There's a problem. Space debris. Everywhere you look, that's the biggest field I've ever seen. Let's hope that collision didn't damage this ship. Uh, Jovan, prepare to take a spacewalk. I'll contact Mission Control. Mission Control, this is Medea. Come in, Mission Control. Come in, Mission Control, this is Medea. Well, Jovan, we've lost all radio contact with Mission Control. Why can't we hear me, dear? We seem to have lost all radio contact, General. Can't we reach them? I'm transmitting but receiving no response. We're tracking them and they're still on course. Since Medea is still on course, we're going to assume that their radio has malfunctioned. If it's not serious, they can repair it in flight. If it is serious, we'll have to wait until they reach Janus 2 for a complete report. And what if they don't contact us from Janus 2, General? Always looking on the sunny side, aren't you, Frank? Well, I just think we should be prepared for anything, sir. We can always launch a rescue mission, Frank. Right now, I think it's best to wait. With the General's permission, I'd like to volunteer for a rescue mission, should it come down to that. Uh, keep that in mind, Frank. Let's hope it doesn't come down to that. Jovan, let me help you out of that spacesuit. Well, what's the extent of the damage? Two sun sensors sheared off and the antenna foil is completely twisted out of shape. What are the chances of repairing them in flight? It's no problem to replace the sun sensors, but that antenna foil is another story. Damn. This is all my fault. Used to be you could go for days without seeing any debris up here, and now it's everywhere, and I let my guard down. Sir, I could try to repair the antenna foil. Don't bother, Jovan. If it's as bad as I think it is, we'll have to wait until we reach Janus 2. Then we can replace the whole thing. How much longer until we reach Janus 2, Captain? About two weeks. 
Without radio contact, those two weeks could seem like an eternity. We'll just have to make sure that it doesn't turn out that way. Jovan, I want to commend you on your quick reaction when we got hit by that space debris. Firing that maneuvering rocket kept us on course. I'm afraid I stammered a bit. Feelings or no feelings, you acted quickly and decisively. I was impressed. That's funny, but watching you react in that situation, well, you did exactly what I would have done. I'm flattered by the comparison, Captain. My understanding was that the clone program has been beset by problems. Colonel Kane is confident that all of our problems have been eliminated. Jovan, do you think all the problems are solved? Yes, sir. What could possibly go wrong now that we simply follow our orders? Well, I suppose it all depends on whose orders you follow. What do you mean, Captain? Nothing. Look, I'd feel better if we changed the subject. All right. Do you mind if I ask about your personal life? My personal life? Well, since I questioned you earlier in the mission... You're entitled to hear my side of the story. We clones don't have families or personal lives, and it's something I've always been curious about. So they haven't been able to breed out curiosity, have they? Well, actually, I'm a poor example. My personal life has always been very public. My mother died shortly after I was born. Her generation didn't have the benefit of cloning. My father was a four-star general, so you can imagine how many military installations I've been in. <laughs> I, I knew how to salute before I could walk. Naturally, I joined the service. I transferred into the space program eight years ago, and I've been up in space ever since. My life probably doesn't sound too exciting. In fact, it probably sounds quite similar to your own upbringing. My upbringing was very strict. You think I got away with murder? Now, one thing I learned at an early age was to do as I was told. You'd be surprised how fast you can learn when a four-star general takes a belt to your behind. So, you learn to obey orders, too. Yeah, the hard way. Funny thing, though, to this very day, that's one thing I can't tolerate. Disobedience? Exactly. If a man can't obey orders, he's not worth a damn. Three more days and we'll reestablish radio contact with Medea. I certainly hope so, sir. Frank, you're not exactly exuding confidence, you know. I'm just being realistic, sir. This is our first mission with a clone and a human. And I think we should prepare ourselves for any eventuality. For a man who heads the clone program, you don't seem completely convinced that their behavior problems have been corrected. Reprogramming can do only so much, General. There's always some margin for error. I thought we'd sufficiently reduced the risk for this mission. Now you're talking as if that clone could give Jason trouble up there. I'm certain the clone is trustworthy, sir. I just feel we should have a backup mission ready to launch if something else should happen. Well, we wait until we hear from Janus, too. Don't forget that Jason Tucker is up there. He can handle himself. I hope you're right, sir. Captain, we've established visual contact with Janus, too. Good. Fire maneuvering rockets one and three. Rockets one and three fired. Prepare to initiate docking maneuver. All systems ready. Fire maneuvering rockets two and four. Rockets two and four fired. Give me five degrees right yaw. Five degrees right yaw. Prepare to dock with Janus two. That was a picture perfect docking maneuver, Jovan. You may secure the ship while I go look at the antenna foil. As you can see, the design of Janus 2 is anything but new. Apparently, our scientists couldn't improve on the good old wheel. At the center, Artronic, the robot computer, assembles and transmits the incoming data. And on the rim of the wheel, where we are now, millions of sensors collect data on cosmic radiation, radio signals, or any other unusual disturbances in the surrounding area. This view defies description. That's incredible. Absolutely breathtaking. And silence. Nothing but silence. You know, I envy you up here away from the Earth and all the pressures and intrigues of the space program. Right now, it all seems so far away. I'm confused, sir. Well, now that the antenna foil is repaired and the robot computer's on board the ship, I'll be returning to Earth. You, you'll be re returning to, 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 to Earth? 
Absolutely. Those are my orders. M- m- my orders are, are d- d- different. Oh? What do your orders say? M- m- my orders say I am t- t- to leave you on Janus 2 and return t- to Earth alone. Well, I think we can disregard your orders, Jovan. Obviously, there's been a mix-up. You're the one who's staying behind on Janus 2. He's a very insecure man, liable to turn on you at a moment's notice. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, whatever you say. Look, if you don't believe me, we'll radio mission control again and clear up this mess once and for all. He's managed to conceal his true personality from everyone. That won't be necessary, Captain. No, I think it is necessary, Jovan. I won't have you feeling that you were tricked into staying up here. Now follow me to the space probe. Jovan, your orders are to return to Earth alone. Follow me, Jovan, that's an order. I'm right behind you, sir. I'm sorry I knocked you out, Captain Tucker, but my orders are to leave you on Janus 2. Howard Duff again. And here's the concluding act of Two Faces of Evil. It certainly was a relief to hear Jason's voice from Janus 2. Yes, sir. You made the right decision to wait for the probe to reach the space monitor. Well, once you've been in the space program as long as I have, Frank, you develop a sixth sense about these situations. I'm afraid that my offer to rescue Jason must have sounded rash, General. I sensed danger, so that was my immediate response. And a perfectly natural one, Frank. I remember how grateful you were after Jason rescued you on the Ares mission. If it's all the same to you, General, I'd rather not talk about that. I understand. I simply meant that you were eager to return the favor. There's no question I owe Jason Tucker my life, sir. I just get a little tired hearing it all the time. Well, no need to get touchy, Frank. If you'd set aside your feelings for a moment, we could concentrate on our main concern, which is to bring Captain Jason Tucker safely back to Earth. Yes, sir. General Gordon, I have radio contact with Captain Tucker. Good. Be right there. Come along, Frank. All right, let's hear the transmission. This is Mission Control, Medea. Come in. This isn't Medea, Mission Control. This is Captain Tucker, and I'm still on Genus 2. Here, let me talk to him. We're tracking the space probe, and it's on its way back to Earth, Jason. What are you doing on Genus 2? Recuperating, sir. Recuperating? Not every captain can say he's been clobbered from behind by his lookalike. So then, locked you out? Colder than a mackerel, then took off in the space probe. Tell Frank his clone packs a wallop. He is your choice, Jason. But you spent 18 months training him. Is this how they obey orders, Frank? They are trained to obey orders, Jason. Something went wrong. That's the understatement of the year. All right, you two. This is no time for an argument. We have to figure a way to get Jason back to Earth. General, I can be ready to launch a rescue mission within 24 hours. Frank came to the rescue. Now, that's poetic justice. Well, let's not be hasty, Frank. Perhaps we can use the clone to get us out of this mess. You sure about that, General? We'll radio Medea, and I'll simply order the clone to return to Janus 2 and pick you up. Wait a minute, General. Before he clobbered me, Jovan said he had different orders in mind. That's impossible, Jason. Frank personally briefed the clone. That's right. The clone had the exact same orders you had. Then why did he say he had different orders? Obviously, he lied. I was hoping a situation like this wouldn't develop. I think I have a possible explanation. Let's hear it, Frank. Did the clone ask about your personal history, Jason? Sure, I told him all about myself. So what? For some reason, the clone chose to steal your identity. All he had to do was acquaint himself with your background, then return to Earth and take your place. How did he think he'd get away with that? As soon as you'd contact Janus 2, you'd discover I was here. If the clone had thought this out carefully, he would have killed you, Jason. Well, since you seem to be the man with all the answers, Frank, what do you suggest we do next? All we can do is wait for the clone to land and court-martial him. And where does that leave me? General, I can still be ready to launch a rescue mission within 24 hours. All right, Frank. Prepare for a launch. Yes, sir. Major, where do we stand in the launch countdown? We're at T minus three hours and 15 minutes, General. With every minute that we draw closer to Frank's liftoff, that clone is moving farther away from Janus 2. Wouldn't it be easier to have the probe reverse course and return to Janus 2, sir? Of course it would have, Major, but that clone is unpredictable. There's no telling what it might do. I think it's best that we follow a known course of action. We, we haven't even tried to contact the space probe, sir. 
Well, we don't need to. It's obvious what's happened. But there are two sides to every story, General. Didn't Captain Tucker say that the clone mentioned a different set of orders? Yes, but we already determined that the clone was lying. How? No one ever questioned the clone. What are you getting at, Major? I have a feeling about this, General. Call it a woman's intuition, but if the clones are trained to obey orders, isn't it possible that the clone was obeying a different set of orders? Frank personally gave the clone his orders. Are you saying that Frank could have given the clone a different set of orders? I'm not saying that Colonel Kane is behind all of this. I'm merely saying that we should contact Jovan on the Medea space probe before Colonel Kane launches. I have a feeling you may be right, Stoddard. Contact Medea immediately, please. Come in, Medea. This is Mission Control. Over. This is Medea. Over. General Gordon would like to speak with you, Jovan. Fine. Put him on. How's everything going, Jovan? Just fine, General. We did have a brief altercation on Janus too, though. Oh? What sort of altercation? Well, Captain Tucker insisted that I was supposed to stay behind on Janus too. Of course, you had different orders. Yes, sir. Colonel Kane instructed me to leave Captain Tucker on Janus too, but you already know that. Of course, Jovan. What else did Colonel Kane tell you? He told me I should be careful around the captain, that he was insecure and could turn on me at a moment's notice. And sure enough, he did. And so you had to use physical force to ensure that Captain Tucker remained on Janus too. Yes, sir. How did you know that, General? So, Van, I already spoke to Captain Tucker on Janus too. He explained what happened. It seems that Colonel Kane purposely gave you a different set of orders. He l l lied to me? Yes, so, Van. And from the look of things, he intended to blame everything on you. But, but, but I d didn't do anything wrong, sir. I, I was only following orders. Of course you were, Jovan. No one's blaming you. Now, I want you to compose yourself. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to give you some new orders. I'm listening, sir. You are to reverse course and return to Janus too. Once there, you will pick up Captain Tucker and both of you will return to Earth. Am I clear, Jovan? Extremely clear, sir. I have a feeling that you and Captain Tucker will both be testifying at a court-martial. Captain Tucker? Oh, am I glad to see you, Jovan. I've only been up here two weeks, but I've determined this is no place for a human. Or a clone? Or a clone. I'll talk to General Gordon about changing those orders to leave you up here. I'd appreciate that, sir. You're not angry at me, are you, sir? Well, why should I be? You were just following Frank's orders. Mm, that's the truth, sir. Call me Jason. <laughs> that's an order. <laughs> yes, Jason. So you reversed course, returned here, and docked all by yourself? That's right, Jason. Congratulations are in order. Remind me to buy you a drink when we get home. Or is that against the rules? <laughs> no, Jason, I, I'd like that. You know, I can't think of anyone I'd rather have rescue me than me. <laughs> and I can't think of anyone I'd rather rescue than me. <laughs> Come on, Joe Van. Let's head for home. that you and Jovan had a chance to patch things up on the trip back to Earth, Jason. I'm satisfied this whole mess will be straightened out in court, General. After Frank's undergone a psychiatric examination. How'd you determine that Frank was behind all of this? Well, I can't take credit for that. Major Stoddard here suggested that I radio Jovan on the space probe. I'm grateful for that, Major. So am I. Frank was so certain that reading emotions and feelings out of the space program would reduce human error. He honestly believed that. Sure, and for a while he had me believing that Jovan was the villain. I'm afraid he had us all believing his story. But what did he hope to gain, General? A reputation. Somehow Frank hoped that he would become a national hero after he rescued Jason from Janus II. The colonel told me that he was the one that rescued you on the Ares mission, Jason. Well, I'm not surprised. He fabricated this whole scheme to vindicate himself. Vindicate himself? The Ares mission to Mars failed because of human error. Frank Kane's human error. All these years, he's been planning to reconstruct the same situation, but this time, casting himself as the hero. And instead of having a human commit the error, he substituted Jason's clone to take the rap. He went to all that trouble? Oh, it was no trouble for Frank. 
It was perfectly natural. Does this mean that clones won't be used in the space program anymore? I don't think anyone will blame you, Jovan. A new director for the duogenetics program is all that's needed. A new director, huh? Has either of you got any suggestions? Oh, I have a feeling that Major Stoddard would make an excellent director, sir. Me? Why on earth choose me? I think what Jovan means to say is that the clone program needs a blend of emotions and efficiency. Am I right, Jovan? If you're interested, Major, the job is yours. I don't know what to say. Say yes, and uh, that's an order. <laughs> <laughs> Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. Two Faces of Evil was written by Mark Trella, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Howard Duff. Our stars were Barney Phillips and Howard Culver. Featured in the cast were Byron Kane, Marvin Miller, and Peggy Weber. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. Associate Director of Sears Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. And the recording engineers are Joe Wachter and Hal McDonald. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Music 103, 24 hours a day. KMO XFM, St. Louis. CBS News. The waiting continues near the Egyptian embassy in Ankara, Turkey, where terrorists are holding hostages. This is John Bohannon reporting on the CBS radio network. Earlier today, Palestinian guerrillas forced their way into the embassy firing machine guns. Two guards were killed, and now Turkish police have surrounded the building. More from Hal Walker. Only two of the 26 windows in the front of the Egyptian embassy show any light at all, and there is no movement behind them. The rest of the windows are dark and shuttered. Somewhere inside, four men, believed to be Palestinian terrorists, are barricaded with 20 hostages. They wait while the Turkish government considers their demands. Safe passage for the four, the release of Palestinian prisoners from an Egyptian jail, severance of diplomatic ties between Turkey and Egypt, and establishment of a PLO mission in Turkey. The intruders proved that they meant business when they killed two guards while shooting their way into the building. Turkish officials insist that all the hostages are unharmed, despite earlier reports of bodies inside the building. Armored vehicles and carefully concealed government troops ring the embassy now, but so far no move has been made to eject the intruders by force. Hal Walker, CBS News, Ankara. President Carter is back at Camp David in Maryland after another secret visit, this time to Marvin Porterfield's home in Martinsburg, West Virginia. After talking to Porterfield and a few neighbors this morning, Mr. Carter returned to Camp David. And late this afternoon, he invited more than a dozen journalists to the presidential retreat for a briefing. CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite was there and describes Mr. Carter as a deeply troubled and worried man who hopes the time has come for a turning point. Administration officials say Mr. Carter still plans to make his radio and TV speech Sunday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Many domestic airlines DC-10s are back in the air. The Federal Aviation Administration lifted its grounding order earlier today and also allowed foreign DC-10s to fly into and out of America. The FAA's Langhorne Bonds says he allowed the wide-body jets to fly again because he's satisfied that safety issues have been resolved. But he also wants the planes to be redesigned for safety in the years ahead. We are very confident, as are all the other aviation authorities, of the ability of this inspection program to deal with all problems that can come up. We are less confident that over a 15-year span uh, or more, which is how long the aircraft will be in service, whether such tight inspection intervals are appropriate or will be sustained with the same kind of intensity that we know they will be now. The FAA says the DC-10s will be allowed to fly with current engine mounts because increased inspections will catch any cracks before they expand to dangerous proportions. 
A jury in St. Paul, Minnesota tonight convicted five Chippewa Indians of charges of conspiracy and assault in last May's takeover of the Red Lake Indian Reservation Jail. U.S. State Department officials say President Somoza of Nicaragua is back in Managua after an earlier trip to Guatemala. Somoza apparently met there with officials of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Two days ago, when much of the world was concerned about Skylab falling to Earth, a woman in a Brazilian village was more concerned about giving birth. America's space station and the baby were reaching Earth about the same time, so she named her child Marcos Skylab Galisa in honor of both events. The mother is described as poor and unmarried.